Dr. Shannon McConaughey is a native of Alabama. She has fond memories of going to the space shuttle launches uh, from NASA uh, because both of her parents were engineers. Uh, long before Jennifer Lawrence made the bow famous with the Hunger Games, uh, she was an expert in the traditional recurve bow, and she's made a promise that she will not shoot anybody today who asks a question that's not quite on target. Uh, she matriculated at Vanderbilt University for undergraduate, and as far as I can tell, she took every course possible. She majored in cellular and molecular biology, mathematics, and classics. Go figure. She still reads, reads classics for pleasure. And last week when I gave Rand rounds on anabolic androgenic steroids, I gave her PTSD because she was reminded of the fact that she had to submit urine specimens for analysis when she was a member of the varsity swim team for the Division I Vanderbilt, where she also captained uh, the team as a senior. Uh, so, among many things that she does better than I do, she also has mastered trivia. Uh, one of her great accomplishments was to be on the Washington State ACP winning team of Jeopardy back in 2015. She's also excelled in research, and she's covered two topics that I found intriguing. When I interviewed her, I saw this article that she had published on insects. She studied circadian rhythms and olfactory learning in the cockroach. And she paused and without irony said, uh, that particular insect has a particular parallel with learning in men. <laughs> she also has a publication in the study of risk factors for fighting in NHL hockey players. Among the risk factors she identified were missing teeth, a proclivity for drinking beer, and wearing ice skates. <laughs> She has done, she's had a long-standing interest in curriculum development, uh, which is not unusual. What is unusual is that she has dedicated herself to the science of learning and scientific uh, development of curriculum that's effective in teaching. And this year she's done extensive work with Drs. Freeman and Sheehan that she's going to present today on how you teach complex thoughts and complex procedures such as bedside cardiac ultrasound. I've had a terrific time working with Dr. McConaughey. I've learned a lot from her. Uh, she is very, very gritty. Um, she's one of these people who will look you in the eye and say, I can do this. And she's got a track record of doing that over and over and over and over again, which is probably why she was able to tolerate 10,000 yards of swimming on a daily basis when she was a university student, in addition to doing this triple major. What I'd like to do is have Dr. McConaughey come up here, and I'd like to have you give a really great round of applause for two reasons. Uh, one, she is just a magnificent uh, physician and scientist, as well as human being, and she's one of the last two chief residents who have the pleasure of working with Dr. Bremner as department chair. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so I, today I do want to talk about ultrasound and I also want to talk about uh, human learning. Um, so I have no disclosures. Um, and this really is kind of a talk in two parts. Um, I want to talk about how we use ultrasound at the bedside, cardiac ultrasound specifically, um, as well as some of the challenges and difficulties of using focus or focused cardiac ultrasound at the bedside. Um, and then have, after acknowledging kind of that this is something hard that we're trying to do, I want to talk about how we as humans learn um, difficult, complex topics, um, and then talk about some teaching strategies for how we can teach these things um, as doctors and teachers. Um, and so in the tradition of Grand Rounds, I'm going to start with a case that illustrates a patient for whom focused cardiac ultrasound might be very useful. Um, so this is a middle-aged man with known coronary and peptic ulcer disease who comes in with lightheadedness and shortness of breath. Um, and he is hypotensive and tachycardic. Uh, EKG, which you have at bedside, doesn't show clear ischemia. All your labs are pending. 
So this is most often in the emergency room, sometimes in the ICU, where you have acute symptomatic hypotension and you have a brief window of time of which to kind of do an evaluation, an initial evaluation, and make some initial treatment decisions, um, acknowledging that your labs will be back shortly. And so this is someone who you might um, effectively use focused cardiac ultrasound to answer questions like, why is he hypotensive? Will he respond to fluids? Is this someone who may need early inotropes? Um, this is not a new idea. So this is a quote taken from an opinion piece out of an academic emergency room um, where the staff physicians were using bedside echo uh, to do this very thing, to streamline their initial workup for some specific diagnoses. Um, and this is from 1988. So this idea is, is decades old. Um, so why are we talking about it now? Um, there's clear clinical appeal to this idea, right? I can, I can pick up an ultrasound probe at the bedside. I see a dynamic picture of the, the cardiac physiology. Um, you, you can lay eyes on it, and you get some immediate answers. Um, and so for things like hypotension, um, among other diagnoses, this can be clearly helpful for your streamlining your initial workup. Um, and indeed, when they looked at uh, initial assess as an initial assessment tool, this was specifically for symptomatic hypotension of unclear etiology. 80% of EM docs were able to accurately um, name the, the correct diagnosis after a 15-minute initial assessment with echo, as opposed to 50% of emergency room physicians who were doing their initial assessment without echo. Um, so this does have uh, utility at the bedside. Again, why are we talking about it now, right? If this is a 30-year-old concept, um, the thing that has changed, I think, in the last five to 10 years is how accessible this technology is. Um, the device there on the left is, oh, I don't have my probe, my probe's in my backpack, um, is a, the, the newest product that actually plugs into your phone, and the probe is about the size of a cell phone in terms of length and can easily fit in your pocket. Um, this retails for $2,000. So any doctor who really wants to do this, um, for most US physicians, right, that's within the realm of what you could buy as an individual. Um, the system on the right there is a, the, a tablet system that retails for $6,000. So these are now approachable prices for um, emergency rooms, small hospitalist groups, ICUs, um, and individuals. And so that, I think, is really the big game changer and why this is being used uh, so much more frequently now. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that when I talk about focused cardiac ultrasound or focus, this is distinctly different than the limited echo, right? If you, if you go into ORCA, you can order a limited echo study, um, but that's not what we're doing with focus, right? A limited echo, you have a sonographer who comes in, and they still have the ability to attain any view of the heart that they want to, and if they see an abnormality, they're trained to recognize that and do further evaluation. When you and I go in to do focus, we have a specific diagnosis in mind. We have a limited number of views that we really should be trying to attain, um, specifically tailored to those diagnoses. And the ones that have been studied and are supported by the major societies um, in terms of in, uh, Society of Echo, Palm Crit Care, EM, all the societies have kind of coalesced around this short list of diagnoses, which we think focus can be effective for. Okay, so how do we do this, right? You're at the bedside of this hypotensive patient. You have a specific one or two of these in mind, maybe that you're, that you're wanting to work up. How are you going to get from picking up the ultrasound probe to uh, an accurate diagnosis? So as I see it, here's the, uh, the workflow. So you need to know what views you should get to work up the diagnosis you're concerned about. You have to actually have the technical skills to get those views. You need to be able to um, understand if the view you're getting is good enough quality to actually use, right? Because you may be able to get a, a view that is okay, but not good enough to use for clinical diagnosis. So there needs to be a quality check there. And then you have to have the cognitive skills to actually interpret that image accurately. So if you can do all of these things, then theoretically you should be able to get to a correct diagnosis. So for example, with pericardial effusion, um, I start here because I think this is the most approachable diagnosis. Um, it, it can be, the, the views you get for this are easier for the early user, and it's a relatively simple interpretation. Um, 
the, the sensitivities, I will admit, went, uh, vary widely. The studies have been extremely variable in their design and the training that the, the subjects in these studies get. So for example, the study that showed a sensitivity of 54%, the residents in that study only got an hour and a half of echo training um, to learn like all of echo before they were sent forth to do, to do this. Um, the studies that train the residents more robustly tend to have sensitivities in the 90s, 90% to 100%. So this can be done um, with relatively good sensitivity and very good specificity. Um, and the, actually the more recent study that I, that I think was very well designed and well done uh, showed 100% agreement between bedside echo users and the gold standard of a formal echo. And not only that, but there was 100% agreement between the early users and the expert bedside users. So this is something that is approachable to beginner bedside ultrasound users. Um, so how are you going to do this if you're wanting to diagnose a pericardial effusion? So I said you need to know the views. Um, and my goal today is not to teach you how to do these views, but I just want to kind of walk through what you might do at the bedside. The um, easiest kind of first view to get is the parasternal long axis, which for those of you in the room who do this, this is probably the first view that you learned and is the first view that I would teach if I was teaching this. Um, and that's because the anatomy is predictable. So where you put the probe doesn't vary much from person to person, um, nor does it vary that much based on their positioning. And this is what you would expect to see. Um, so you have the left ventricle labeled there. And then at the bottom, fluid, in the pericardial space that should not be there. Okay, so this is what a pericardial effusion would look like on a parasternal long axis. You don't have to have that quality of a view of the heart, right? It doesn't really matter how well you're seeing the aortic valve if you can visualize the pericardial space, which is why I think this is an approachable diagnosis for early users. But you never want to get one view. You always want to get at least two views to verify what you're seeing. So the next view you might try is called the subcostal view. This one varies a little bit more for those of you who have tried to get this view on um, people who can't position or who are bigger. If there's abdominal wall fat or distension, it can be hard to get this view. Um, but this is what you would expect to see. Again, right and left ventricles are labeled there and again, fluid in the pericardial space. And again, the bar here is relatively low. It doesn't matter if you can't visualize the, the valves really well. If, if what you're looking for is a pericardial effusion, you should be able to see that pretty clearly. So going through our process again, you've got two views. You presumably have the skill to get, to get the view. And again, the quality bar is relatively low for this diagnosis. Either you see fluid or you don't, and then you have your diagnosis. Okay, so for kind of the entry level, this is not a difficult thing to do, okay? But unfortunately, it's not all that easy. So if we go back to our patient, um, let's say you, put, you, do, you obtain those two views, they don't have an effusion, okay? So you don't really have an answer or much help yet. So the most common thing you might look for next is, uh, is the ventricle working? Is it working normally or not? Um, and that is a much more difficult uh, kind of question to answer. And it's been well studied. Um, it is possible, right? We, we, we know we can do this with the right training at the bedside. Um, again, there's a range of sensitivities that vary based on uh, from study to study, and I think largely do correlate with the amount of training that subjects in these studies received. Um, and I will just, we'll talk about this a little more, but this is a more technically challenging question to answer, and it's easier for us to make mistakes um, when we're making these more complex diagnoses. There's more that goes into assessing LV function than just fluid around the heart, yes, no. Um, so i will talk about a, a few of the reasons why this is a little bit harder. The one, uh, per, or excuse me, the one transthoracic window we have not talked about is called the apical window. And this, I think, is what makes LV function uh, assessments significantly harder, is that this is not a reliable um, window in the sense that it varies from person to person. It varies a lot based on positioning, body habitus, um, if a patient has underlying lung disease, um, if you can't position them correctly. There's a lot more uh, potential complications to getting a good view here. And actually the um, ASC, the American Society of Echo recommendations, 
puts this on the table as like maybe don't try to learn this unless you're you're going to really put some effort in. It's it's significantly harder. But um, if if you get a good view, this is what you should see. Okay, and this is why it's this is such a great view if you can get it because you got four beautiful chambers, two clearly visualized valves. You can see both the RV lateral wall and the LV lateral wall, so you get a great picture of how the heart is functioning if you can get a good view. Okay, and here I want to um, highlight the technique here really matters. Okay, so this is a classic um, kind of technique affecting interpretation that we are all familiar with. So this is a healthy subject here um, with a PA film versus the AP film. All right, and so same person, same time, all I did was flip them around and we're all, we're all trained to look for or to expect relatively larger heart size in an AP film. Um, and we take that into account when we're interpreting these films, right? And it's because we know that you can get this falsely, false sense of an enlarged heart. Um, and so if you didn't know that, you might call cardiomegaly from a PA, or excuse me, from an AP film, right? But we take that into account and we sort of correct mentally for that imaging technique change. The same thing can happen with echo. And if you don't know the errors that you might be making, then you can make inaccurate clinical diagnoses. So here's an example that comes from the apical view I just talked about. Um, it's something called foreshortening. And so this is a, a kind of a 3D graphic of the heart here. And the dark green is the correct plane. And so this is why it's called the apical view, is that the probe is near the apex of the heart on the lateral thorax. And if you're doing this right, the imaging plane should go through the true apex of the heart, which you can see there. And so you're capturing the left ventricle at the true long axis, right at its greatest length. If you move your probe even about 20 degrees off, you can see the foreshortened plane there is that gray plane. And you can see how it's cutting up higher on the ventricle. Okay, and you're still gonna see four chambers with this view because it sort of ends up in the same place as the correct plane, but you're gonna get what looks like a, a shorter length of the ventricle and that can fool you into thinking that it's working better than it really is. And so if you just look, it's not that big of a difference, right? It seems like such a small, like why should that make such a difference? Um, but if you look at the 2D pictures taken from this, this is from the correct plane that goes through the true apex of the heart compared to the foreshortened plane. Um, and you can see a visual difference, right? It looks much shorter. The end of the apex of the ventricle looks more rounded and the wall looks thicker. And sometimes you can have a ventricle that's not functioning normally, like someone who has a decreased ejection fraction. But if you get a foreshortened plane, like the one on the right, it looks normal. And so you can call or fool yourself into thinking that you have a normal heart when really you have a, a heart with reduced ejection fraction. And if you don't know that you're not getting a quality image, you'll miss it. Same thing comes up with um, IVC, inferior vena cava ultrasound, which we get all the time. Um, and this being, the utility of this could be a, a talk in and of itself. Um, but we use this, for better or for worse, to predict fluid responsiveness. Um, and we, you know, this is probably the most commonly obtained view that I see people getting. We do it on the floor, we do it in the ICU, we do it in the emergency room. And you're looking to measure the maximal IBC diameter um, and use that to predict their fluid responsiveness. The problem is, is if you slip even a little bit, you're no longer getting the maximal diameter. Right? And since you're not imaging in the short axis, you're imaging in the long axis, unless you're very careful with your measurements, you may not realize that you're off and you end up underestimating the diameter. Right? So a small thing, but if we're using this to make clinical decisions, we need to be very aware of the potential errors in technique that are kind of built into this process. So kind of sum summarize here a little bit. How can things go wrong, right? I don't want to discourage you too much. This is something that we can do, but we just need to be aware of the potential pitfalls. So if you are obtaining images that are poor quality or, or inadequate quality and you're not aware of it, then you can make clinical errors. If you're only getting one view and not verifying those findings in a second view, you can make clinical errors, right? And then, of course, the, the risk of misdiagnosis is no different with ultrasound than any other imaging modality, right? There's always risk of just wrong interpretation or missing things that are there. And for that reason, among others, um, this is meant to be a mostly qualitative assessment. 
um, that were focus is best used for things are either normal or significantly abnormal, and we're not very good at the in between, and we're also not very good at more complex quantitative assessments. So they've looked at um, experienced. Physicians who are trained and experienced in bedside echo, like emergency room doctors that have done at least 100 scans, which I'd be, I don't know if anybody in the room has done 100 scans. It's, that's a lot of experience. And they could still, they only correctly identified tamponade physiology 57% of the time. And they could only correctly identify focal wall motion abnormalities 50% of the time. So even doctors that have done 100 to 200 scans can't kind of pick out or reliably pick out these more complex diagnoses. So when you're using this, just keep in mind, it's a, this looks normal or this looks really not right. Um, and anything in between, if you're questioning, call for formal echo. The other complicating factor, right, we're really kind of fighting up here, uphill here a little bit. Um, unlike sonographers who typically do this um, with a better machine, more training, and often in awake patients who they can position at will, we are usually trying to do this in a critical illness situation with someone who is maybe not awake, who is ventilated, who can't move, and who may even have bandages, right? Like sometimes they have bandages all over their chest and you can't even get the probe where you want to put it. So we, there, are, there are other complicating matters aside from the modality itself that make this difficult. Okay, so transition a little bit. So how do we build technical skill, right? We acknowledge that this is difficult. Um, there's ways that we can mess up. So we're trying to perform at a high level um, using something that is technical. How do we do that? How do we get there? The obvious answer is it starts with, it starts with how you're trained in this, right? Um, and so what are we teaching and how are we teaching it? And I will just frankly acknowledge, we don't even know how much training you really need to get good enough at this. Um, the American Society of Echo originally recommended 75 scans, practice or training scans before you ever started doing this independently. And the ACC originally recommended 150 scans. Those numbers were not evidence-based and were, um, I think, obviously daunting to, to users who aren't getting frequent scans. It'd be hard to build up those numbers. And the emergency phys physician group has more recently recommended 25 to 50 scans, which they acknowledge may not actually be enough. So nobody really knows where the right target is, what's the right number, um, and it varies, likely varies from person to person. There's also a lot of barriers to training, which is one of the reasons we would like to define how much you need, because it's hard to get your hands on machines to train, and it's hard to get really instructor time. There's not that many people that are uh, good enough to teach this and teach it reliably, and so, it would be helpful if we knew how much training you actually needed. Currently, um, there's not much in the way of consistent training. I know here we don't, the internal medicine residents don't get consistent training in this. Um, and it hasn't been studied well across specialties, but anesthesia has done kind of a specialty-wide survey, excuse me, a country-wide survey of their specialty, and only 36% of anesthesia residents get any training in this. Um, and they use it quite frequently uh, or would use it quite frequently if they had training. Um, and of those that receive training, 60% or 65% get some sort of hands-on training, which is good. But I would argue that these, these people that are in the lecture-only group, that's not actually training. Um, this is a technical skill. I don't think you, it'd be like learning to drive a car just from a video, right? You can't, it's not something you can learn just from a lecture. Um, and I just, again, wanna acknowledge that this is a high complexity learning task. So if for those of you who, who have not used this skill, um, this may be overwhelming to you. For those of you who have used it, I want you to put yourself back to when you were a new user and think about all the things that you're asking people to do when you teach them this, right? You have the ultrasound interface, which, which comes with a whole bunch of knobs and settings. You have the patient interface and the probe, which is not intuitive. And then you're not asking someone to just get one image, you're asking them to integrate their anatomy knowledge, their physiology knowledge, um, and take multiple 2D images to make a 3D conclusion about the heart, right? So this is an overwhelming task um, if you're not used to it. Okay, that brings me to another, we're gonna kind of transition here. Okay, so we're trying to do something difficult. 
um, how as humans do we process this sort of task? Okay, and I'm, I'm sticking with the biking analogy because it's fairly universal. And I think I'll ask you guys again at some point to kind of mentally remember what it was like to learn riding a bike. Um, yeah, I'll ask, we'll, we'll go back to that. It was traumatic for me. Um, so how do our brains work, right? How do, we, how do we process new information? How do we learn complex topics? Um, so it's humbling, I think, but uh, useful to acknowledge that our working memory or the part of our memory that um, deals with new information is exceedingly limited. So your brain can only handle two to four new items of information simultaneously. After that, nothing. And for most of us, it's actually only three, okay? Long-term memory, thankfully, as far as we know, is completely unlimited, which is as humbling as the first point is, I find that equally amazing. Um, and so expertise is not, or intelligence even, that is not defined by how much you can hold in your working memory. It's really defined by how sophisticated are the organizational structures you have built in your long-term memory. So when you're teaching people you're giving them new information and trying to help them organize it and move it into their long-term memory. That's really what you're trying to get at when you're teaching people things. So lest, lest you feel like your working memory is better, um, I just want to kind of I want to demonstrate this and I want you to feel your brain working as you're processing these sentences. So this is two variables. Okay. Which I think is fairly easy to grasp. Okay, and then this is a three variable sentence. And I want you to ask yourself the question, who was kissed? <laughs> some people are still working it out. It looks like some people have got it. Okay, here's another example. It's okay if you're still on the first one. This is another three variable sentence. I want you to ask yourself, if you're avoiding dairy products, we're assuming this is dark chocolate with no dairy. You're avoiding dairy products, but you, have a, you want something really sweet. Where do you go to get a cake? Okay, so again, feel the mental work. Um, and now I'm gonna show you a four variable problem that was presented to people in studies where they were defining the limits of working memory. This is a four variable problem. And the, what the, what the uh, subjects were asked to do was pick out, the, all they had to do was pick out the correct uh, option of the last sentence there, greater or smaller. And I, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to stay on the slide long enough for us all to work this out. Um, many of us can't, can't do this. Um, and and I, I think I got it, but it took me three times and many minutes each time. And you can almost feel your brain, you're trying to hold on to things, and then you can feel it slip away. And that's the limit of your working memory, right? That's when you can no longer accommodate any more information. So if this is what we're left to deal with, right, we have a pretty limited um, amount of capacity or excuse me, limited capacity to deal with new information. This concept of the cognitive load has been developed. And those are the stresses that you're placing on someone's working memory when you're teaching them. Okay. And so the intrinsic load is just the inherent complexity of the material. Right? And echo, for example, is a highly complex material. If there's a lot of elements in what you're trying to teach, it's a highly complex thing. So this is a low complexity learning task, right? You can just sit in it or you can eventually you figure out if I move my feet that the vehicle will move. And then this was our high complexity learning task, right? There's a lot of skill going on here to be able to pull this off without crashing. Extraneous load. This is um, sort of the, the burden that you're putting on the learner in how you're presenting the material. Right, and so this can be high or low depending on how you choose to teach something. There's always some inherent extraneous load um, just because there is a built-in inefficiency in terms of kind of information communication, um, but it can be high or low depending on your design. So for example, this is an efficient way to answer the question, what is a square? Quickly uh, comprehensible, 
This is also a valid way to answer that question, but you can feel it taking more um, kind of effort on your part as a learner to process through this than the first one. Okay, now this specific example is a visual versus uh, verbal in presentation of information. That is not always true, right? Visual is not always better, but I think for this question, you can just, the point is that there's a clear difference in, in one of these is easier for you as a learner and one of these is harder. Um, an example of completely uh, unnecessary extraneous load, again, go back to when you were learning to ride a bike because that is a high intrinsic load, right? You're learning, you have to keep the wheel straight, you have to look ahead, you have to make sure you're pedaling fast enough not to fall over, there's a lot going on. And I don't know how many of you had parents that did this, but my dad, his solution was just to like run behind me and yell at me like, <laughs> don't fall or pedal faster. And none of that is helpful, right? So that is an example of an extraneous load. As the learner, it is completely unhelpful to hear that. Um, Germain load, the last kind of stress that we place on the working memory, this is the good stuff, okay? This is, as the learner, this is the mental effort that you're putting into like wrestling with this new material, processing through it, organizing it, okay? That is the, this is the part of learning that's gonna help you actually move this from working memory to long-term memory. So this is what we want, we wanna give our learners space to have this kind of germane load. Um, and if we don't give them space to do this, they're not gonna learn efficiently. So that brings us to this concept of the cognitive load in whole. And that is each of these individual stresses added up can't exceed your working memory, okay? And if whatever exceeds your working memory just falls out, it doesn't stick. So if, you're, if it's a low impact task, you don't have to worry about this too much because there's plenty of room in the working memory. But if you're teaching something complicated like focus, you have an incredibly high intrinsic load. The extraneous load becomes more important, right? How we teach it becomes more important because for many learners, there will be no room left for germane load and they will either not learn at all or they will learn very inefficiently because you're not giving them mental space to really process through that material and organize it. So this is someone who's clearly exceeded their germane load, right? They've lost it. Um, this was me. So I'm going to go back to um, focus here for the last 10 minutes or so um, and talk about how we're teaching this now. Okay, and for those of you who have had training in this, I expect, I expect this will look familiar. Um, this kind of setup is how it is done in most, C actually all CME courses that I've seen, um, workshops put on by major societies, and um, really kind of basically every curriculum that I have seen operates generally in this way. And so there's something, knobology is the term used for how to work the user interface. Um, I did not make that up, that is, that's the term. Um, so there's some lecture or uh, online module or reading about how to work the user interface, maybe a demonstration. And then there's some discussion of, again, usually an online module or text or lecture on patient positioning, where to put the probe, what the transthoracic windows are. And then there's, again, some form of information giving, um, whether it's online, in-person lecture, or text about the expected anatomy for each view um, and the pathology, like how you would um, interpret uh, abnormal findings, okay? And then there's, on, there's hands-on practice. Okay, and after just talking about the limits of our working memory, how well do you think this works? Yeah, it's, it's immediately overwhelming, right? The amount of information that you are giving people before they ever get to touch a patient or put their hands on an ultrasound probe, they're already lost, right? They're, or, no, they're not lost, but they're already operating in that inefficient space where their working memory is overwhelmed, even before they touch the ultrasound. So, my goal, or our goal, um, was to streamline this, right? So take the person from this completely overwhelmed place, decrease or pare down the intrinsic load of what you're teaching, um, if it, present the information in a way that fits better, so decreasing the extraneous load, and build room in for germane load, right? Build, give your learner space to process through that information, help them learn more efficiently. So I want to talk about how we did that. Um, this was all done on a simulator. 
okay, which we can, if we have time, we'll, we'll talk about that. that. had some unique benefits because a teacher did not have to be there for all of this. Um, that said, I think a lot of these concepts translate to bedside teaching as well. Um, so this is not, these are not uh, strategies that are just work with a simulator. And um, I did this work, Dr. Sheehan, Florence Sheehan is one of our research cardiologists, designed this simulator, um, and then also working with Dr. Freeman to develop some of these educational tools. So goal number one, pare down the intrinsic load, right? This, this is the overwhelming amount of information we have to deal with eventually, but you don't have to deal with it all at once. So the first thing we did is we said, okay, we're on a simulator, we're getting rid of that. You don't need to know that unless you're standing in front of an ultrasound machine and can actually put hands on yourself. So that's gone. And then when the transthoracic windows, we're only gonna tackle one at a time. I'm not gonna tell you anything about the apical window. You're not there yet. And then views. I'm not gonna talk to you about any other views except for the peristernal long axis view, right? You're just gonna learn one view at a time and you're not gonna get any information about what a bad left ventricle looks like. I'm not gonna tell you anything about pericardial effusions, right? I'm just gonna focus on one view in a normal heart and we're just gonna start there. So then all of this goes away. If you can successfully do this, right, and pick out a little piece of the larger task, um, eating an elephant one bite at a time, right? Um, if you can do this, then you can pare your extraneous load down as well. Because why would I give you didactic information about an apical window if, if we're not gonna practice that yet. So the next logical step was if we're gonna take these little pieces of the larger task off, I'm only gonna give you a didactic information about that little piece. And then you're gonna practice that little piece until you get it. So this is my term, this is not a term you'll find in the literature, but I call it point of learning didactics, right? So you're only gonna get the lecture information or the online module or whatever it is, you're only gonna get the piece that you immediately need to practice what you're about to do. So if this is what we paired the extrinsic load down to, right, one window, one view in a normal patient, that's all I'm gonna tell you about. The other strategy um, that I can't take credit for because this is built into the simulator is uh, the immediate feedback piece. Okay, so we're creating this loop where you get a little piece of new information that you're about to go practice and you're gonna get direct and immediate feedback on how you're doing. Okay, so this is again, our foreshortened view from the apical window. Um, and this is actually what happens when you're on the simulator. So you have, um, you're looking at real patient images, but there's also this uh, model up in the corner of the simulator that shows you the correct view and where you are relative to the correct view. So you can use this as a learning tool or a feedback tool, right, to match up to the right answer. Um, and you can then, if, once you get to the point where you feel like you're mastering this, you can actually take that aid away and try to do this on your own. So this is a feedback piece that you can bring in and lean on more heavily as an early learner. And then once you get a little bit better, you can hide it and kind of test yourself and see how well you're doing. After you acquire an image, you can also see, this is more immediate feedback kind of coaching tool here. You can see the view that you got on the right and see how different it is from the one on the left, right? So after you acquire a view, there's immediate visual comparable feedback as, well, this is where I'm at, this is why it's not right, this is why it looks different, and this is what I'm trying to get to. So putting that all together, what we're trying to do is create room for germane load, right? So you cut off a little piece of the whole learning task, pare down your teaching just aimed at that little piece, and then theoretically, right, if we're doing this well, then you've now created a ton of mental space for the person to just focus on processing that task. Then, if you have them practice, right, build in the deliberate practice piece, they're just working on that one piece, and you've given them room to kind of organize that, Theoretically, they should be able to take that new piece of information and move it into their long-term memory, right? And now you've sort of created or designed this loop for them to learn. And once it's in their long-term memory, remember that's limitless. So now they can go back to the original learning task and they're ready for a little bit more new, right? And so you can, again, create this loop. Um, scaffolding is a, another, another term for this that really refers to the specific aspect of going from simple to complex. So just like that, we do this when we teach people how to ride a bike, right? You start with training wheels, you start with someone holding your handlebars, guiding them for you, and so you're just learning one little skill at a time. And eventually you're riding your trike by yourself, 
and then the training wheels come off and you've got someone to hold the bike for you, right? Every step of the way, there's a little bit less support as you learn piece by piece and work up towards the whole task. So um, again, scaffolding is just one, one kind of piece of what we built in here, but I think that's one of the more important aspects of this curriculum was starting with one view in a normal person and not doing any pathology and then slowly working up towards, okay, now I can get multiple views in someone who has abnormalities. So, does this work? Yes, it does. Um, so, we tested this curriculum. Um, this was from, this was a historical comparison group. Um, so we had, we had a group of residents uh, go through the, the scaffolded curriculum and we compared it to residents that had completed the old curriculum. And they learned in about half the time. So uh, twice as fast. And there's actually more information in the new curriculum because we added the IVC that wasn't in the old one. So they're learning more information faster. And they are just as good, if not better, in terms of their post-training outcomes. Um, so again, small differences matter when you're doing ultrasound. And so this is angle error. Large numbers are bad. That's how far off you are with your probe. So you can see pre-training, everyone was really bad. 80 degrees off, not good. Um, after training, both groups learned. So the old curriculum worked. It may be slow, but it worked. But the new curriculum was slightly better. Well, significantly better, actually. We then tested this prospectively. Um, and so this was a randomized trial, actually, of uh, residents, nurse practitioners, that was, I think it was just residents and nurse practitioners, randomized to either the old standard curriculum, which was all of the didactics before hands-on practice, um, versus the new scaffolded curriculum. And I think this is actually the most remarkable finding of the study, is that only 45% of the group randomized to the standard curriculum even finished. So I, I, we can't pick apart why they didn't finish. I suspect it was, some of it was related to the inefficiency of the curriculum. Um, but 92% of the group that was randomized to the scaffolded curriculum completed it. And the finding of uh, increased efficiency also bore out. So the group that was doing the scaffolded curriculum, again, finished in about half the time, uh, despite the fact that there was more information. Because of the low completion rates, we actually couldn't analyze, it was underpowered to analyze uh, post-training outcomes because there were so few numbers in the standard group, but just the numbers were, looked approximately equal. So this seems to work. Um, and again, as I said, I think it doesn't just apply to focus and does not just apply to simulation. So take home points. Focus is a very powerful diagnostic tool. Um, it, it, is, it is growing in terms of how much it's being used, and for those of you who aren't using it, you will encounter it. Um, it's, it eventually, I think, will be treated as essentially as the new stethoscope, right? It's being seen as an extension of the physical exam. Um, and it is approachable for beginners, right? I don't want you guys to leave thinking you can't do this. Um, there are some pieces of this that are very easy and can le be learned fairly quickly. But I do think it's worth acknowledging that there are nuances and there are complexities and we should recognize our limits as well and kind of know where you're at in your growth, in your skill growth, um, and don't, be trying, don't try to do things that you haven't developed the expertise for yet. Um, and then in terms of the second half, um, we don't have a lot of space to take in new information, right? And so as teachers, it's hard. You're working with someone who has a limited um, kind of limited capacity and so we have to teach to that right this the concept of oh i'm just going to teach more or oh they'll work harder and learn it isn't helping right it isn't helping your learner and so i think really focusing acknowledging the limits and focusing on teaching um less at once but teaching better um can be effective and i think we have evidence or at least we have found evidence um in our studies that this does help learners get get to the same place much, much, much faster. And when you're a resident, a curriculum that takes eight hours versus four hours is a huge difference. Um, so it, it, with, whether you're at the bedside or whether you're designing <coughs> curricula, I think this is worth keeping in mind. And then that brings me to the acknowledgments. Um, so I most importantly want to thank Dr. Sheehan and Dr. Freeman um, for their, Dr. Sheehan for the amazing technology and inviting me into her lab to do some of this work. Um, and then Dr. Freeman as well for working with me as an educator and as a um, sonographer, excuse me, as an echocardiography doctor. 
Dr. Kim is a, an education PhD who helped uh, kind of validate some of these learning theories. Karen DeJang is a sonographer who taught me a lot of what I know about the technical skills in ECHO. Um, and then Dr. Anna Walt and Dr. Bremner for giving me uh, this job <laughs> <laughs> and for inviting me to talk today and also for being fantastic mentors this year. I have learned so much. Um, and then Renata Thronson, I, just, I don't know if she's here, but she was the head of the clinician educator pathway in my residency and really taught me uh, or really helped me become a much better teacher as a physician. So. Thank you. Questions?